Finally, President Buhari heeds the call for the sack of service chiefs and restructure and save Nigeria from being a failed state, says former Vice President Atiku Abubakar. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Ann Okon. President Muhammad Buhari has replaced service chiefs, congratulating them on their overwhelming efforts, underline the word overwhelming, at bringing peace to the country. The new service chiefs are Major General Leo Irabo, Chief of Defense Staff, Major General Ai Atahiru, Chief of Army Staff, Rear Admiral A.Z. Gambo, Chief of Naval Staff, and Air Vice Marshal I.O. Amao, Chief of Air Staff. And joining us to have this conversation on security matters are former Air Vice Marshal Femi Badebo and Public Affairs Analyst Besman Jombo Nze. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us, and uh, good evening. Thank you. Good evening. All right, I'm going to start with uh, the Air Vice Marshal, former Air Vice Marshal. Um, Nigerians, in fact, before we had this conversation, what we were going to talk about was the call by Northern Elders Forum uh, to, the, to Mr. President to deal with the insecurity in the country. And of course, they mentioned the sacking of service chiefs. And then a few minutes down the line, the president has decided to change these service chiefs. Let's take a look at these service chiefs that have been changed. As someone who's worked in the service, Mr. President thanked the former service chiefs, talking about the fact that they have done very well. Can we really say that these service chiefs have done well? And if they did well, why was there so much calls by people in the country for them to be replaced? Well, thank you for having me here. And I'll say very quickly here that the uh, service chiefs serve at the pleasure of the commander in chief. He gives them assignments. And um, assuming you're in a, in a classroom or in the university environment, uh, the head of class, the vice chancellor, whoever it is, is the one who grades and assigns the max. So when the man who appointed them says they have done very well, who am I to say they haven't done well? They've served at his pleasure. And uh, when he deemed it fit, he has replaced them. Not sack them, he has replaced them. Because if we look at tenure, in the past, they right now look like the longest serving service chiefs in the history of Nigeria. So you can't have seen they've done badly in the eye of the man who appointed them. Now, the, the um, Northern Elders Forum had also mentioned that the um, lack of intel or failure of intelligence and um, in the part of service chiefs was responsible solely um, for the rising spate of insecurity. Uh, do, do you agree with the Northern Elders Forum, or are there other issues that um, somewhat added to what we're experiencing as insecurity in the country today? I'll say that um, it can be very frustrating if you're doing your best, and your best doesn't seem to be good enough. And um, it has come from lack of, I would say, adequate resources, not necessarily funding, because the president has funded the services very well. But in terms of the equipment to do the job, and then a lack of cohesion, which we saw uh, at various times uh, during the course of their work. And in fact, towards the end of their tenure, I'd say in the last couple of years, there were, the, the general complaints seemed to be like a couple of them were outdoing each other in an attempt, hopefully, with maybe to take over as the chief of defense staff. Because the practice in the past had always been that the chief of defense staff used to come from one of the service chiefs. But as it is now, and as I can see, you still have the wrong name for the air marshal, uh, for the air force, which is Amao, not, uh, not Alao, please if you can correct that, and so on. So you, you find that people, um, it can be very frustrating. And then, you know, mixing uh, military operations with politics is something that is very, very difficult to play with. Because as you can see during the case of the Kankara Boys uh, release, 
while the army was trying to put up one show, you, we found two governors, Katsina and Zamfara, trying to outplay, outdo each other as to who released, secured the release of these boys. At the end of the day, it was a, it was a military operation. And yes, certain things could have been done. But then uh, it also showed you a situation where people are not working together. And um, that has been the play all through, coming from the Northeast, and particularly now into the, uh, the Middle Belt states, where you are Northeast and Middle Belt states, where you find the governors also arming their own private militia, and um, sometimes being the ones funding the people who are working on the ground. Uh, it's, so I can assure you that the service chiefs who everybody is saying have been sacked will heave a sigh of, sigh of relief tonight because they'll sleep well, because they don't, no longer have to worry about the crisis in the, any part of the country. Okay, let me go to best man now. Um, Mr. Nze, why has security issues become mostly the most talked about thing in the country? I mean, it's the biggest front burner issue in the country. Um, I, I, I mean, we see all kinds of insecurity, you know, kidnapping. We're talking about people being killed on their rice farms. We're talking about cultism, which is rife also. I mean, everywhere you turn in the country, there is one issue or the other that states have to deal with. But then we also know that security agencies are on their toes. The police, we have the army, we have the JTS. Do you think that maybe the reason why the issue of insecurity seems to be so alarming is because maybe these people are overstretched? Do you think that they're um, overstretched, as, especially for the army and police officers? Thank you very much. Um, once more, thank you for having me. Um, it's a natural thing to say that um, the preservation of lives and property is the number one um, duty or function of a government. So, uh, and the, uh, the instinct of self-preservation is, is also the number one instinct in man. So automatically, when life is threatened, it's going to be on the front burner. When life is threatened, nothing else matters. Because once there is life, even if you are hungry, there is still hope for a better tomorrow. So automatically, the, the issue of security must always be in the front burner of any discourse. So I'm not surprised that it has taken the front burner. Yeah, whether they are overstretched or not, um, unfortunately, we find ourselves in the situation that we are now, probably because of the things we failed to do in the past, probably because of the things we did and we didn't do well. So the whole thing escalated, and right now, we're in dire straits as a people and as a country. So of course, the security, the armed forces, the security um, institutions, and everybody um, that is involved with one security architecture or the other will definitely be overstretched. I will agree with you right now. Every security arm, um, every um, anybody that has anything to do with security, we're all overstretched right now because the country is um, experiencing something quite unusual. So but it's, it's not surprising it, I, that... I'm, so, I'm sorry to cut in. Yeah. Now, now that you're saying that they're overstretched, and you also said something about, you know, things that could have been done, what are the things that you think could have been done to avert, you know, what we're facing today? Because they seem to be heightened tensions everywhere, especially um, with the cattle, um, the herders versus the farmers issue, and other issues, including kidnapping, which has become the order of the day. Could there have been something done maybe in 2015 or in 2016, or maybe even last year, to avert the situation um, from becoming what it is today? What are those things? Could you point them out, please? I, 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 it's not about 2015. It's not about the previous government. No, that is about this government. It is a, it's a failure of planning that um, dates back to years. Um, uh, we look at this, look at, for example, when the Boko Haram issue started, it started as probably a private militia for some politicians um, to gain power for protection. Now it's, it blew out of control. The same way, sometime in the Niger Delta, at a point, kidnapping was 
pockets here and there, it wasn't checked, it blew out of proportion. Um, we've been talking about moving with times and with the world. We shouldn't be having cattles grazing all over right now. Nigeria is big enough. We are developed enough. We are in a world where we should be ranching a cattle. We should be developed to the extent that when we run those cattle, we even get more benefits, more value chain from it. But because we are such a sentimental people, um, we bring sentiments, sometimes primordial, into decisions. And so they want to please people, maybe based on culture and religion, we leave things undone. Mm. Now they have all blossomed. So the things we are supposed to check in the past that we didn't check are today haunting us. And we are suffering for it. But that doesn't seem in things can be done to curtail them. Hmm. I'm coming back to you, um, former AVM uh, Badibu. Um, the, there's been uh, an accusation from certain quarters, including the Southwest, the um, Northern Elders Forum, even the people in the Southeast, uh, that there's been some form of silence over um, major security issues, stuff that could have been spoken up about, um, I mean, um, from key, by key stakeholders. Uh, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar also made a statement yesterday saying that there seems to also have been a culture of silence on issues that have become very big today by not just politicians, but leaders of thoughts. They should have spoken up early enough. Um, concerted efforts should have been put together to make sure that some of these issues were addressed because they were not necessarily issues of insecurity. They were just tensions in certain areas. Do you also um, buy that um, statement by former Vice President Atiku Abubakar? I believe they are all issues of security because food security is, is a major bone of contention all over the country right now. We find that uh, when they, there are people can go to farm in the north, it's affecting the production of beans. When they can now go to farm in the south, it's affecting the production of cassava, yams, and other staples. And so if we're not careful towards the end of 2021, we're going to be seeing a very serious issue of uh, problem of school starting. Now, when it comes to the issue of, um, I'm, I'm sure we're talking about cattle here. Again, what a lot of people don't seem to understand is that um, cattle is a very interesting form of investment for those who understand. Because, I mean, how much money do you, um, what, well, how much interest do you get in the bank when you put your money in the bank lately? So what has been happening is that a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of the cattle that we have in the South, that are resident in the South, are actually owned by big uh, businessmen in the South. Even though they are being tended by Fulani men, the Fulani have a lifestyle of living with cattle, of taking care of cattle. And from what I used to know in the past, when I served in, uh, in Yola and in some other parts of the North, is that you could actually give a certain number of cattle to a cattle area, and you don't pay him. He makes his money off the of the of the uh, younglings that are that are born, and takes a, maybe one for every three or four that's born. So after a couple of years, your your number of cattle have increased tremendously, and he's got the few that are his. And then when you sell, it is when you sell, you actually know how much you have. So people keep investments in cattle. And it's because they don't want to pay the normal cost of ranching and all that even people in the South are not coming out to speak about it. Another issue I'd like to point out here is that um, our people in the South are not interested in the military. And so... Virtually every person you find from the South in the military is someone who has gone out on his own for recruitment and he has served his time and is in retirement and is still not recognized by the people in the South. Whereas in the North, I mean, they, they know the youngest man who is getting into the military from their local government of their community and they follow his progress and they are the ones who actually sometimes fight for him to get appointment like service chief and all that. So by the time... Uh, somebody from the South is in that kind of capacity. He has no political person to fall back on. And if he makes a wrong move, he's all on his own. 
This is the reason why when it now comes to dealing with tension, the only people that the politicians in the South can go to are the former uh, boys that they use, you know, to, 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 to do all their dirty work during the campaigns and the politicking and so on, quote and unquote, called thugs. Uh, yeah, some of these thugs quickly move up the line, become very comfortable and all. But how much capacity do they have for training, for uh, understanding issues at a major level? And you have retired military personnel, officers and men just lying idle all over the place. So this is the problem of the South. The South has to begin to identify people who have the relevant training to do certain things and use them so that we can be sure that we're getting the right people report on it all. Interesting. Um, let's talk about insecurity generally across Africa. I, I, I have been um, talking to certain people in different parts of the uh, continent, and there is also a reoccurring denominator, which is insecurity, and they come in different shapes uh, and forms. Um, recently, in the African sub-region, um, the ECOWAS has called for member states uh, to pay up their commitments, I'm talking about monies that can fund uh, the uh, fight against insurgency and uh, insecurity, uh, being that we, Nigeria, are on this table and we are also suffering from the insecurity either in the northeast or um, in the southwest. Do you think that maybe this can help us deal with at least some form of insecurity, partnering with ECOWAS? Um, because Mr. Bestman has also said that, yes, it's actually true that our forces are stretched, whether it's the JTF, the police, the soldiers. Do we need help from the ECOWAS in dealing with our situation? Or does the security situation in Nigeria need a Nigerian solution and a Nigerian consensus to deal with it? I'll, I'll, uh, this question is for you, uh, Mr. Bestman. <clears throat> um, I remember that um, under the last regime of President Jonathan, at a point we brought in mercenaries from South Africa who came to fight alongside our military men um, in the Northeast. And we recorded a, um, a level of success, which I believe probably if we had sustained, maybe we would have done better or done more. Um, I also expect, because the, the Maghreb region, was, of course, from Libya, Mali, all those other countries with high level of violence, I was also encroached into our territory there. So whether we like it or not, uh, we need a form of help. Now, where the help comes from is what I don't know. I talked about the mercenaries. The mercenaries came and they did a good job. I don't want to go into the politics of why they were stopped, but we need help. One of the help I recommend is, it's unfortunate that we are facing this level of um, crisis and insecurity, and I've not heard of mass recruitment into the army. I've not heard of mass recruitment into the police. Neither have I heard of mass recruitment into the Air Force and but the But there have been several recruitments if, under the Buhari if, administration if for the police. We've had 6,000, if not more, over time uh, for the police. I don't know about the army, but the police recruitments have been ongoing. We, we had, uh, I think, one in 2018 or 2019, is, if I'm not mistaken. It is not massive enough. Did you say, it it's, not, did you say it's not massive enough? enough? When we look at, okay. It is not, because, okay, I don't expect us to deploy the military to check kidnapping. I expect us to massively recruit men into the police, deploy some of them into the forest reserves, deploy them on the streets, and those very volatile areas, like the Kaduna Abuja Road, for example. If we have massive deployment of police there, of course, with technology, we would have done a bit better. I think with the situation on ground, we need much. We need more recruitment into the armed forces and into the police. And if we deem it um, necessary or enough, we can still bring in some mercenaries from other countries who have probably better experience in handling the insurgencies that we are facing right now. I'm talking more about policing, is it really about employing just employing more police officers? Or is it about the welfare of these police officers? Don't forget, October 20 of 2020 is still very fresh in the minds of people. 
there is not just the issue of getting policemen in, recruited into the police force. How are these people recruited? What is the welfare situation of these policemen? Which average Nigerian would want to be a police officer? Is that something that people would want to get into today? We have to face the realities of these things. So if we say we want to do a mass recruitment, what is the mindset of the person who wants to be a police officer? Are they going to be able to do the job of policing? What processes are they going through so that they can actually carry out the job of policing well? Do we have what it takes to recruit massively people into the police force right now? And can we take care of these men so that they can do their jobs duly or di diligently? Now, <clears throat> I said this to you. Um, if you advertise tomorrow that we need 10,000 policemen, mm -hmm. I can tell you authoritatively that... Excuse me. If we if we advertise that we need ten thousand policemen tomorrow, you will see at least five hundred thousand Nigerians apply. Now, the desire or the need to work is still in Nigerians. I agree with you. The government should now take care of its own side, boost the morale. We must boost morale. Morale in this area of welfare, take care of these people, because when it, when a man knows that hey, I'm fighting for my country. And there's something for me to fall back on. And when the morale is high, they will give their best. The government will work out a strategy or a process for taking good care of these people. But I can tell you authoritatively that a lot of Nigerians are willing to join the police, to join the armed forces, and to even give their best for this presence. And that's why you are seeing even non-military men joining in the fight now. You see in some areas, people are taking it upon themselves we have people in the JTFs. We have civilians coming to say, okay, we want to take the bull by the horn ourselves. So I don't think um, we have such a lethargy of people wanting to join either the police or the armed forces. The important thing is that the government should take off its side while the necessary things are done. Um, uh, ABM, let's talk about the army now, um, uh, the other forces. We're still talking about the issue of um, welfare. I remember in 2018, if not 2019, if I'm not mistaken, a video emerged of soldiers complaining about what they had to fight with, you know, moribund um, facilities to, or equipment to fight um, the, the war against insurgents. Uh, and 20, uh, 2021 is the year that we're in. Is there a boost of these officers and men's morale in fighting these insurgents? Is there um, enough welfare to take care of these men, uh, even for the ones who have you know, died in, in gallant battle? Is there something done to make sure that these men um, would always want to fight for their country and defend the territory called Nigeria? Let me tell you, every uniformed soldier um, is naturally at a high level of morale to do his job. It is when they are deployed and kept for too long in the area of deployment that tension starts to rise. And of course, when they're not getting, um, you know, equipment and uh, their allowances on time, that causes these things. I'll tell you that when you go on a UN deployment, like um, troops that go for peacekeeping operations, there are standard rules where after six months you are moved back from the area of uh, from the front line to an area where you can actually relax for two weeks, you know, um, but you know, and so on, and and eventually go back. And after nine months or a year, you are actually rotated back to your country, mm -hmm. so that somebody either somebody else comes to replace you or you take a certain number of at least like a month off to see your family and all that. Mm -hmm. When we go on operations in Nigeria, to the northeast, to the northwest, to the midwest, and the south side, sometimes these troops serve for three years and they cannot get home. It is just the grace of uh, the phone now that everybody can use maybe a WhatsApp call or so to see their wives and children mm. that there's some level of contact. So this also breeds its own frustration. You see, when you're in the front line and your colleagues are dying left, right, and center, you begin to wonder. Are they waiting for me to die too? Because there's a limit to how long you'll do the job that you'll be at alert. So we must continue to, we must find a way to do this uh, 
rotation. Mm. I'll I agree with uh, my friend here, best man. The, the number of personnel that we have to handle the kind of operations we're handling now uh, is just too small. And when you're talking about creating jobs, job treatment, and so on, instead of boosting the army or the police or whatever, we are creating new agencies. And these new agencies are not going through the right kind of training. You know? So I find it very uh, uncomfortable that when I was, at the time, as a young man, when I was as a, as a commander and going to state executive council meeting, there were just four of us, uh, myself, the police officer, the army officer, and uh, you know the man from the SSS because I was I was in Kano and and maybe Yola, but these days you find that in a state government security council meeting you are finding up to nine ten uniform people, and you're wondering it's like what kind of training are these other uniform people having? And everybody is fighting now to carry arms. Carry arms? Do you have the same training as the army officer or the army soldier, or the soldier, and so on? So we need to get these things clear. Uh, uh, like Bestman said, get enough policemen, and we're talking of well more than 200,000 policemen compared to what we have in Nigeria now to do the work. And can, then can the country afford in, that? To get our ass right, be, be, forest rangers. Forest rangers will be trained and armed to do the job. In the for our forest rangers, rangers are not armed and are not trained to take on the, you know, the, 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 the cultural militias that are there. Well, I mean, one last question before we wrap up this conversation, gentlemen. Um, the new service chiefs, uh, it seems to be something that everybody's applauding. Oh, finally, these service chiefs have been replaced. But is that really what we need right now? Yes, we've asked for this and it's been done. But is this what will bring respite to us in the ongoing fight against insecurity? Um, I mean, of course, how they will perform remains to be seen. Is this really the issue or are there other underlying issues that we need to also deal with for these men to be able to carry out their duties responsibly, on time, without fear of favor? I'll start with you, AVM, and then we'll end with Bestman. Okay. Uh, General Irabo did a fantastic job in the Northeast. It was highly commended. Even when he was taken out, everybody wondered why he was removed. But like I said, you can't keep somebody in one position until he gets exhausted. And coming back now as the chief of defense staff is fantastic. But there has to be a reorganization of the defense headquarters. A situation where the army, the chief of army staff is, yeah, is operating without due reference to the chief of defense staff will still result in the same situation we had before. Um, now we have a new sub, a chief of air staff. I hope that the, the CDS can bring them together to work collectively and to have combined operations as against the service operations. Mm -hmm. Most of the operations in the north, northwest, uh, middle belt, uh, don't really concern the Navy, but Navy can supply some down support to the defense of the Navy. Right. So, I, I, you see, once you have new blood, change is good. It's always good. And the new man will, will, will hit the ground running until he gets tired. So, I definitely will see some things. Okay, and finally, best man. Well, um, the change of personnel alone will not do the job. Um, in, 19, in 2019, President Buhari signed a, a joint security strategy where it was recommended that every, it's not just the armed forces now, a synergy, even among the civilian people, among anybody who has something to contribute to security. Mm -hmm. So if you change personnel and we don't change process, we don't change our thought process, we don't change our work process, and we don't change our attitude we still end up with the same result. I think we should visit that document by the president, which gives a synergy and a joint operation um, for the prosecution of these wars. I think that's the way to go. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, former AVM Femi Badebo uh, and, uh, of course, Bestman Nze, uh, both for being part of this conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for staying with us. Uh, we'll take a short break, and when we return, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar warns that Nigeria risks becoming a failed state. The foundational challenges are not resolved. Well, we'll talk about this and more when we come back after the break. Stay with us.